Uh, turn your Bibles to Philippians chapter 2. We're going to look at this passage. We're going to look at this verse. Uh, it's going to be up here on the screen for you also. But Philippians chapter 2, let's look at verse 12 and let's look at verse 13. It's kind of our key verse for today. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Look, what, look at this verse. It, it talks about two things that are happening here. The Bible teaches when it comes to change, God has a part and we have a part. You can circle these words. Do you see them? They're popping out at us here. The work out and then the work in. The work out, that's your part. That's our part. The work in, that's God's part. And what this verse is telling us is that God is working in every single one of us. That's good news, isn't it? Now, it doesn't say here work for your salvation. It says work out your salvation. Because if you are saved, God has already done the work of salvation in your life, right? We know what it says in Ephesians. We are not saved by our works. We're saved by the work of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. That's why we take the Lord's Supper every Sunday. We are recognizing that we are all about Jesus. We are recognizing that our salvation is all about what Jesus finished on the cross. But if you're saved, God has a work done in your life that he's still in process of trying to bring it to fulfillment for you. And what he's asking you to do is to work it out. Let it come out. Look what he says here. With fear and trembling. He's encouraging us to take our salvation seriously because there's nothing more important than our personal spiritual growth and finding his good pleasure. Do you see that at the end of this? He, to work for his good pleasure. God has a good pleasure for every single one of you. He has a purpose for you. He has his good pleasure that he wants to see worked out of your life. For it is God who works in you. That word works is actually the word that we get our word energy from. It sounds like the word energy in the Greek. Energy. God's energy is at work in our lives to change us. God gives us the power to change. Now, I want to encourage you today with three tools that God gives us to help us change our lives. Here is the first one. It is the Word of God. That's the first tool that we receive to help us in this change process in our life. The Word of God. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. Look what it says. All scripture is breathed out by God, and it is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So the Bible changes our thoughts. The Bible changes our hearts. The Bible changes our minds. The Bible changes our motivations. The Bible changes our desires. And you know, when our thoughts and our hearts are changed, it leads to change in our actions. I told you this about a year ago. Uh, I was reading about a study that Willow Creek did in its church members. After many years, the ministry team at that time stopped and they wanted to know how good they were doing in making disciples. Were they actually seeing disciples matured and disciples growing? So they put on a list things that you should see in the life of a person who's following Jesus if they are a mature disciple. Doesn't matter right now what those things are, but they chronicle those things. These are what we should see in the life of a mature disciple. Then they studied the personal practices of these people that were in their church. And what they found was there was absolutely one indispensable practice that was connected with maturity. That if they saw somebody who was mature as a disciple, as a follower of Jesus, they would find this practice in their life. And if there was lack of maturity, they would also see that that practice was not something that was being practiced in their life. And you know what the practice was? Reading God's Word daily. That was the indispensable practice that resulted in maturity, in discipleship, in growth. If you want to get serious about change in your life, if, if you want to see God transforming you, if you want to see 
God's will, the pleasure of God's purpose for your life be known in your life, you've got to get serious about reading God's word. That's why every year we challenge people to get on a Bible reading program. It's on our app, the Bible reading plan that we have. We have cards on the foyer, the Bible reading plan. Uh, We're going to come out with a new plan here towards the end of this month because we are in the last month of last year's plan, right? How many of you have been reading your Bible? All right, let's just put our hands together. Awesome. Way to go. We need to encourage each other, right? If you want to get serious about transformation in your life, read it, study it, memorize it, meditate on it, because the more you get the Word of God in your life, the more you are going to be changed. Let me just share with you some great things that happen when we read God's Word. Here's the first one. My faith is strengthened. My confidence in God is strengthened when I read his word. It says in Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by what? The word of God. I am cleansed when I read the word. In John chapter 15, 3, Jesus told his followers, you are cleansed by my word is what he says. Romans chapter 12, 2, it says we are transformed by the renewing of our mind. In Ephesians 5, 26, Husbands are told to read the word, to wash their wives with the word of God because the word of God cleanses, it separates. So I am cleansed as I read God's word. I'm nourished and I'm fed when I read God's word. Jesus says that the word of God is as important as daily bread. Oftentimes the Bible refers to itself as milk, as food, as nourishment, and it helps you grow. I receive guidance when I read the word of God. The spirit of God speaks to you and me through the Word of God. That's why David says, the Word is a lamp to my feet and it's a light to my path. I become a winner. I become victorious against the fights in my life when I read God's Word. God's Word alerts me to Satan's schemes and the Scriptures tell us that God's Word is a two-edged sword, right? It is a weapon. When I read the Word of God, I am arming myself with spiritual power and spiritual might. And then finally, I want you to look at this verse. I was reading this verse uh, just a couple months ago in a tent in Kenya in my quiet time, and I came across this passage, and I start reading it, and it just spoke to me, and I thought, at some point, I just want to share this with our people. But look what Jesus says. He says, everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep, and he laid the foundation on the rock. And when a flood arose, the stream broke against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. So when I read God's word, I become unshakable. I become strong. I become grounded. You know, I underlined that. It's like the man who dug deep. You know, the Lord was telling me in my heart, We all need to dig down deep, right? Not just the surface. We need to dig down deep and have that foundation in our life where we are unshakable, where we are not going to be rot. So the first tool that God uses to change you and me, to transform us, is the Word of God. It's the Bible. And I encourage you to make a commitment this year to dig down deep. The second tool that God uses to change us is His Holy Spirit. God gives us his spirit, his presence. In Romans chapter 8, verse 11, it says, If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So the Holy Spirit is God himself. He's in spirit form. And when you surrender your life to God, he comes into your life. And the Spirit starts working inside you. Look at that. The power to raise the dead dwells in you. And what is he doing? What is his purpose? Romans 8, 29 tells us, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. You were saved to be conformed, to be transformed, to be changed, to look like Jesus. Look what it says, in order that he, in order that Jesus might be the firstborn among many brothers. The Lord wants there to be an army of brothers and sisters who are just like Jesus. How transformative would that be in our world, amen? 
God's plan is to make you like Jesus. That's his ultimate goal, to change you, that you would be conformed into being like him. So the Spirit of God works through the Word of God to give me a new mind, to give me a new heart, to change my life, and ultimately to make me like Jesus. These are the tools that God uses to change us, the Word of God and the power of the Spirit of God. Here's the third tool that God uses, and I just want to call it life, right? God uses life. God uses life events. He uses life occurrences. God uses, how many of you know, God uses sometimes problems and pressures, difficulties and crises to change us, to build something in us, to mold our character uh, when we think about life and how God uses life, the verse that should just jump out at all of us is Romans 8, 28. It's a beautiful promise, right? It should be confident, confidence building for us. Let's read it together, okay? And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Isn't that powerful? To those who love God, to those who are called According to his plan, everything that happens in my life fits a pattern of good. Now, it doesn't say that everything that happens is good, right? How many of you have had some things happen last year that were not good? Yeah. It does not say everything that happens in your life, it's going to be good. No, what it says is everything that happens in your life for those who love God, who are, who are seeking his plan, his purpose in their life, God is in charge. God is on his throne. God is not surprised. God is aware of it. God sees it. He knows what you're going through, and he has a plan through it all for your good and for his glory. Amen? There are times when we can get bogged down. We get depressed with life. I, I can do that. You can do that. We start thinking about struggles. We start thinking about hardships. Maybe we start thinking about things that we're walking through right now that we don't want to walk through. And we're tempted to start thinking, you know, what is going on in my life? Are, are these terrible things that I'm having to walk through? Are they caused by God? Are they caused by the devil? Are they caused by me? Are they caused by just the jerks that I'm around, right? Come on, don't look at me like that. Do you, do you have jerks around you sometimes? Sometimes we have this tendency to stop and get bogged down and fret and get upset. And inside of us, everything screams, I don't want to walk through this. I don't see the purpose of this. I hate this. Why do I have to go through this? Romans 8, 28, remember it. Memorize it. Recite it. God's not surprised. God's got a plan. God's not gone. He has the ability to work his plan through everything, everything. Think about this. If God is going to make you be like Jesus, do you think he's going to let you go through some things that maybe Jesus went through? There were times when Jesus was lonely. There were times when Jesus was tempted. There were times when Jesus was angry. There were times when Jesus was rejected. We need to all remember that God is more interested in our character, not just in our comfort. His main goal for us is not just for us to be happy, it's for us to be like Jesus, right? Hebrews chapter 5, 8, there's an interesting verse there. It says that Jesus learned obedience through suffering. How do you think you're going to learn obedience? Hebrews 2, 10. Listen to this. It says Jesus was made perfect through suffering. How do you think you're going to be made perfect, complete, whole? God's going to let you go through the anvils of life. But he's got a plan. He's got a purpose. Don't ever lose hope. God works in our lives through his word. He works in our lives through the Holy Spirit. He works through our li in our lives through life, circumstances, and, and events. I mean, I look back on my life. There are things that I had to walk through that I didn't like. You too, right? Some of you are walking through that stuff right now, and you don't like it. But dig down deep. Get anchored in the word every day. Trust in the Lord and remind yourself that this is going to work for my good. God is working in my life. He is working his plan. He is on his throne. And if he's allowing me to walk through this, he's got a plan to bring good out of it, right? That's how, we, that's how God transforms us and changes us. So how do I apply these truths? 
How do I cooperate with God? How do I work out what God is working in my life? How do I do that? I'm glad you asked because I'm going to share a couple of things that I want to encourage you to do. There are three choices that you can make every single day that will spiritually empower you. And here they are. The first choice that you can make every day is this. I can choose what I think about. Would you repeat that with me? I can choose what I think about. You make yourself weak or you make yourself strong with your mind. You can empower yourself by getting control of your thought life. Whatever change you want to make in your life, it starts with your thoughts. I want you to look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 20 through 25. We see this truth, the spiritual truth given to us all through the scriptures. Here it is in Ephesians. Put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, thoughts, your mind's activities, right? And be renewed in the spirit of your minds. And put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Put off your old self. Put on your new self. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. See, renewal always begins with new thinking. The Bible word for change is the word repent, right? People don't like to hear that word, repent. Uh, But in the Greek, repent, it's the word metanoia, and it literally means to change your mind to change your mind. When I get saved, I change my mind about the way I think about God. When I got saved, I changed my mind about the way I think about myself. When I get saved, I I change my mind about the way I think about the world. My outlook changes. When I become a Christian, it changes my perspective on life, right? I begin to see things differently. When I get saved, I begin to challenge some of those old ways of thinking, those old values. So if you want to be changed, start by renewing your mind. Psalm 1 says, blessed is the man who meditates on God's word. When we meditate on the word of God, when the word of God gets into our mind, the spirit of God uses it to work in and work out of us transformation. Philippians 4.8, it says, think on these things, right? Whatever is good, whatever is lovely, whatever is sound, whatever has good report. Think on these things is what we're told. Colossians chapter 3, verse 6 says, let the word of God dwell in you richly. Psalm 119, thy word I have hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. Joshua chapter 1.8, I love the story about Joshua. He's getting ready to take over the mantle. Moses hands down to him. He's going to lead God's people. And God speaks to Joshua and tells him, if you want to be successful, Joshua, Meditate on God's word day and night, right? If you're not having a daily quiet time, and if you're not getting in the word and letting the word of God and the power of the spirit of God change you, then you're not going to be able to see in your life what God's best is for you, what that picture is for you. So the first choice I can make every single day is I can choose what I think about. The second choice that I can make every single day is I can choose to depend on God's Holy Spirit moment by moment in my life. Jesus taught his disciples this in John chapter 15. He's preparing them for his departure. He knows that he's going to leave them. And he begins to teach them about fruitfulness and effectiveness and about how to have power in their prayers. And he tells them, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do some things, nothing. A branch is totally dependent upon the vine, right? A branch cannot produce fruit by itself. It's got to be connected. I think it's very interesting that Jesus uses this image to teach us what it looks like to be productive, to be maturing, to be growing, to be effective, to see power and fruit in our life. We've got to be connected. We're the branch. He is the vine. You've got to be plugged in, right? God has the power. It's not automatic. 
You've got to be depending on the Holy Spirit moment by moment, day by day. Well, how, how does that look? Check your prayer life. What are you praying about? If you're praying about something, <laughs> you're seeking dependency upon God in that thing, right? If there's some things in your life that you're not praying about at all, you're depending upon yourself, right? I mean, this choice that I can make every day to be dependent upon the Holy Spirit is to live my life praying without ceasing, as Paul encouraged us. What does that look like? My whole day is a prayerful day where I'm aware of God's presence. I'm aware that he's with me and in me. I'm aware that he's working in my life through events and occurrences all around me. And throughout the day, I'm just dependent upon him. Lord Jesus, I want to glorify you today. Help me to be like you today, Lord. Help me to see who I can minister to, love, encourage, and bless in your name, Lord. There's this dependence each day, day by day, on the Lord Jesus. You know, in our small group, we just uh, went through uh, a lesson on what it means to be a church member. A guy named Tom uh, Rayner wrote this uh, book on being a church member. And the very last passage was on the subject of church. I'm going to have a hard time pronouncing this word. Churchianity. Have you ever heard that word? I think he invented it. Churchianity, right? What does it look like to have churchianity as opposed to a relationship, right? Church shouldn't be something that you check off the box on Sunday mornings once a month or twice a month or maybe even every week, right? Don't have a religion. Have a relationship. If I want transformation in my life, if I really want my life to be about experiencing God things, not just Tim things, or you put your name there, then I can make that choice every day about what my mind's going to be on. I can make the choice every day to have a relationship with the Lord Jesus, not just a religion. And then here's the last thing that I can do. I can make the choice every day to choose my response to life. God's working in you. That's God's part. Working out, that's your part. And God gives us the word. We're supposed to read it. God gives us the Holy Spirit. We must depend upon him. God is on the throne. He has a plan. He's going to work through your circumstances. But here's the, here's the, the thing that you have the ability to do. You have the ability to choose your response to the things that happen in your life day by day. Do you know that? James 1, 2. This is a real popular verse, isn't it? Look what it says. Count it all joy, brothers, sisters. I'm, I'm bought into that part. How about you? Sign me up for that, right? Count it all joy, brothers and sisters, when you meet trial, trials. Trials? Reminds me of that football coach years ago, remember, when they were asking about the game, and he was like, playoffs? Playoffs? What are you talking about? That's the same here. Count it all joy when you meet trials? What are you talking about? Look what James teaches us. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. How many of you want to have steadfastness in your life? And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. The reality is you can choose joyfulness. You can choose happiness. You cannot choose what's going to happen to you tomorrow in many regards, right? You cannot choose what's going to happen to you next week or next month or next year. We don't have the ability to choose in a lot of areas in our life. But you can choose how you're going to respond. You can say, I believe with all my heart that all things work for good. God's got a plan in my life. I love him. I'm trying to find his plan for my life. And I don't like this, but I know with all of my heart that God's on his throne. And he's got a plan for my life. And I choose even in the face of this joy in the Lord. Okay, Lord, what are you trying to do through this? What good are you going to work out of this, Lord Jesus? We can choose how we're going to respond. Whatever happens to you, it can either break you or it can make you. Amen? Amen. You can either get better or you can get better. Bitter, right? You can be a whiner or you can be a winner. There's no whiners in here, right? What really matters in life is not just what happens to me, 
It's what happens in me, in my heart, and that's a choice. Let me just leave you with this quote that I came across. I think it's powerful. I've never seen it before, but it's from C.S. Lewis, a great Christian apologist, theologian. And this is what C.S. Lewis said. You can't go back and change the beginning, but you can start where you are and change the ending. I love that. I love that. You know, January 1st, 2019, I mean, it's just, it's just this random day on the calendar, right? A lot of times we put so much emphasis on it, so much meaning on it, because it does represent a new year. It does represent, in many of our hearts, a new start, a fresh beginning. And when it comes to the Lord Jesus Christ, he is the master of helping stories change, isn't he? As our worship team comes, I want to encourage you to stop and just think about where you're at. Maybe today the decision you need to make is, oh, I need you, Lord Jesus, to be the Lord of my life. 